Hello and welcome to the TFO Football Podcast. I'm Joe Devine and I'm now joined by JJ Bull the Bullet. Hello. I've stopped taping now, just Good. for you. Well, you were being making too much noise. Okay, sorry. Also, Hi. ah, guten tag, Herr Stafford Bloor. Wie geht's du? Guten Tag, Herr Devine. Wie geht's is good. Well, that's good. Everyone's fine, as usual. <laughs> I'm glad we check every week. <laughs> yeah. One day someone's going to say, no, I'm not fine. I'm glad every podcast checks if everyone is. Yeah. Otherwise, how would you know? How would everyone know? Yeah. We've already asked ourselves this morning, really. Did That's we do true. it this morning? How are you? No, I so ignored you when you came in. Yeah, you did. <laughs> you were still watching something. I was you? in a meeting. Yeah. Anyway, uh, loads of football happened this weekend. Um, and, uh, of course, we've got the blore and the bullet here to, to cover everything that one might or could possibly care about, including Rafa Benitez losing his job. Uh, at Everton, of course. 19 games, 19 points. We'll come back to talk about that a little bit later. Norwich, of course, winning a game as well. Great timing for us because we just made a video about them last week. So it's useful that one of their very few wins happened in between the recording and the release of that. Manchester City beat Chelsea uh, 1-0. We'll come back to discuss that too. AFCON, lots of AFCON stuff to talk about. Update end of round two. We're moving nearer the knockout stages now as well. Very exciting when an international tournament gets knockout time. Aston Villa, of course, came back to draw 2-2 with uh, Manchester United. Uh, Philippe Coutinho debut there, as well as Luca Dina. We'll be talking about that, as well as Newcastle Watford, Wolves Southampton, and uh, the strange incident between Real Betis and Sevilla in the Sevilla derby over the weekend as well. We'll come back to talk about that. Plus, a little bit of Uncle Damien time. He's not here, obviously, but we'll be having time with him in our voices. Yeah? Even I don't know what that means. <laughs> well, you'll have to wait to the end of the podcast to find out. Oh, great. Do you know something you don't have to wait to the end to find out, though? About? I think I have a... F- it's The Athletic. Yeah. Because I'm telling you about it now, near the beginning. Theathletic.com forward slash TIFO, all of the best footballing stories and reporting that you could find pretty much anywhere online. You can get a 30-day free trial to try it out for free now. If you don't like it, just cancel it before the 30 days. That's a fine thing to do. You can do that. Uh, but uh, all of the best reporting, some lovely stories this weekend. Seb, what did you enjoy? I have, well, we're going to talk about Rafa Benitez, but I thought that Paddy Boylan and Greg O'Keefe's coverage of the Everton situation was particularly excellent. Yeah. Read that this morning over my morning I coffee. I think Paddy's Very on good. holiday as well, which is quite funny. I saw a picture <laughs> on Twitter he posted from a beach yesterday. Unless he was making an elaborate joke and I've misunderstood, I think it is an unfortunate timed holiday. <laughs> He's probably he would know what was off. coming though. Yeah, he'll be at the beach because he would have seen up. Rafa Benitez's uh, you know ending notes. Yeah, he would have seen Norwich two 0 up and thought, I know that the uh, Slack message is on its way. Yeah. So at least he had some time to prepare. Yeah, well, best wishes to Paddy Boyland wherever he is, if it's a joke holiday or not. <laughs> I don't know honestly. Uh, what was I saying? The Athletic. Visit theathletic.com forward slash TIFO, where the journalists go on holiday at the best possible time. Uh, now, we will uh, leave you, of course, in the warm hands for today and the cool embrace of all of the football that's happened. Yes. Welcome. <laughs> Norwich 2. One Everton. Um, Rafa Benitez said... Losing his job there, uh, 19 games, 19 points. Of course, it was a difficult crowd for him to win over anyway, given his status as a Liverpool legend of yesteryear. Um, Things really didn't work out very well, did we? And we only really had to get to January before it all fell apart. Yeah, and um, what made it worse is that a lot seemed to be sacrificed for the sake of Rafa Benitez and to make Rafa Benitez comfortable in his job. And so uh, I think um, I mentioned that the Paddy Boyle and Greg O'Keefe piece, there's a quote in there where they say, well, they've beat a, uh, they've built a club in uh, Rafa Benitez's image and then they've sacked Rafa Benitez, which yeah. I don't know. If you're a fan, I think you might be kind of despairing of the level of dysfunction. And actually, uh, clearly they are because I was following Nick Miller's Twitter feed on Saturday when the game was going on and Nick was reporting for the Athletic from Carrow Road. And he said it was uh, amongst the most toxic atmospheres he's seen in a away fan, yeah. in a group of away fans. Also, I think um, I think I've read this right. There was a, a fan who tried to make it across the pitch to confront Rafa Benitez at one point. That's not generally a good sign when that kind of thing starts to happen. Banners so. in the crowd as well. Get out of our club. I think I saw a match of the yeah. day. Well, I get it. I get it. 
I, I also think that Everton have been in this situation quite often where they've made a managerial appointment that doesn't immediately put everybody on the same page. Uh, Rafa Benitez obviously walked into quite a lot of opposition, as did Ronald Koeman, as did Sam Allardyce, uh, Roberto Martinez. I, I know it's from a different era, but a lot of his reign was conducted in a you know fairly acrimonious environment. Uh, people got kind of bored of his uh, incessant negativity. And so... In a way, Benitez was just another one of those. And, and the, the problem with that is that when a certain section of the fans are against you from the start, as soon as things go wrong and as soon as there are very legitimate footballing concerns, then that becomes kind of the dominant position. Uh, that is a very loud noise in the background. It's a helicopter. Well, anyway, Rafa Benitez, another notch on the bedpost of disappointment, JJ. Uh, there are names in the... In the bedpost? The... <laughs> There are names in it. You know, you get into bed with a manager, don't you? That's what happens. As 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 uh, as Seb said before, he quoted uh, Paddy and Greg as saying, you know, they've built the club in his image at least over the last six months and then and then fired him. Um, before we get to the names of people who might replace him, we actually had Paddy Boylan, the Athletics Everton writer, one of the two, in uh, in recently to talk about uh, Everton. Um, one of the sections was uh, related to recruitment. Now, Rafa Benitez's part of that was very small because obviously they didn't have a lot of money to spend in the summer. Uh, you know, Everton are a club running not too far away from, from, from FFP restrictions, I think. Um, but uh, it's fair to say that uh, the problem for Everton whilst Rafa Benitez was included in that in the last six months, goes far beyond him. Uh, yes, it is to do entirely with this. Farhad Mashiri is his first name, Farhad, isn't it? Sure. Yeah. Uh, it's all to do with what this guy's done since he came in, and we explore this a lot in the video, which is on TIFO IRL. Mm. Uh, but, I mean, I've got my, my notes that I had from that up here, and I can even just go through. Some of, like, some of the amount of money they spent on different people is astonishing. Sure. Like, it's, not all of them are bad, but some of them are... I mean, like, so, uh, Morgan Schneidlin was 20 million. Yannick Balassi is 26. And these are decent players. That's an awful lot of money to spend on those, even. And then you had uh, Sigerson, they signed 44 million. Walcott was 20 million. Michael Keane, 25 million for Michael Keane. Awful lot. Mm-hmm. Davy Klassen, 24. Pickford, 25. I can keep going through these. Alex Iwobi is one that always stands 27 out. 27 million mind. pounds yeah. for Alex Iwobi. And the thing is, with that, with those players, like, as we said with Paddy at the time, there's one or two on that list, like Yannick Balassi, for example. Mm. If Yannick Balassi had worked out, I wouldn't mind paying that much money, right? Unfortunately, injuries have, have struck him down. Yeah, and sometimes um, it's a bit of a bet when you have to do these. You can gamble, look at the total yeah. money they spent. Um, As a trend, though, it's terrible. 100%. I, mean, I think it was 17-18 was the season I think he came in. I think it was 2017 he came in. Mm. And they spent £182 million pounds <laughs> of a net, I think it's net spend of minus £69 million. Sure. So I may be a bit off of the numbers there. Then the next season they spent £89 million. Then the season after they spent £108 million. Yeah. And they bought nonsense. Yeah. The, the, think of what you could have bought for that. And then this season, Benitez has come in and they've bought um, uh, Gray, Damari Gray for 1.8 million. Andros Townsend was free and Solomon Rondon was free. Yeah. Like it's not quite the same level of thing. So he's not had the same um, level of spending as other managers, but I don't think that really matters. But you can see like what they've bought is mid-table average and they are exactly mid-table average. Even like, so like Jordan Pickford is, uh, we were just talking about this with Alex before, like he's a decent keeper, right? He can play international level. But he's not a top four keeper. He's not, there's, there's some mistakes in him. He's not, he's just not the, the standard, I would say, that dictates you in the Champions League. Yeah. When you're spending 180 million or whatever in one spending spree, and sure enough, you're spend, you know, you're selling as well to try and make up for it. You could buy amazing stuff for that. Like there's some decent, I mean, Ben Goffey's a wise purchase and he's expensive because he's English and he was young when they got him. But the recruitment's clearly really poor, and most of what makes a manager or a team good is clever recruitment, and they have mm. completely got it wrong, and it seems very haphazard. Well, another thing, Seb, that we talked about with Paddy during that video was um, was injuries. Now, injuries uh, seemed very clearly uh, to be a bit of a theme at the, at the club, and I mean, I'm not sure as to the suggestion as to why that is the case. Maybe it's just unlucky, um, but it seemed to have affected a huge number of players. Injuries, of course, have had a big impact on this season. Um, Dominic Calvert-Lewin has, has returned recently, uh, but there have been uh, various key players out for, for key parts of the season. One of the reasons they're doing so poorly. Do you have any sympathy for Rafa Benitez in the context of what JJ has just talked about, the sort of four years that precede him, or uh, is that not really the way that we should be looking at it? I think you have to isolate the different grievances. I think there is one massive overarching problem at Everton, which is that they have no real... They, they aren't really definitively anything. It feels as if 
there are some owners who come into a club and they have a really set idea for what they want to build and how the kind of the basis are, are around which they want to um, construct a, a club and you know different departments and we're going to recruit with this strategy and we're going to you know, play with this one and we're going to appoint this type of coach and the thinking is clearly very very muddled uh, and the legacy of that is um, the restrictions with FFP and the imbalance squad that now exists at, uh, at Goodison Park and so I have sympathy in, in the sense that Benitez is dealing with a less than perfect situation but then at the same time so for instance with the Dominic Calvert-Lewin injury the crowd really 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 hated Salomon Rondon really hated him and so you have a negative and then you accentuate it with yeah. a double negative yeah. uh, so I have sympathy it could have been better also um, there is a little bit of a caveat in that nobody really saw Carlo Ancelotti going back to Real Madrid yeah. that kind of happened pretty quickly and that might have been a different type of era, but I don't think I don't think Rafa Benitez helps himself. He seems to be he's like one of those guys that has to control everything. That's the way he comes across. That might not be fair, but he seems to know better than everybody how everything should run, and that includes things which are well beyond the normal footballing brief. Obviously, amongst the abs- uh, amongst the departures at Everton are um, Marcel Brands, head of recruitment. Um, the head of, I think, head of physiotherapy at the club. That might not be the right job description, but someone within that area. He left the club as well. I forget his name. So you have a situation where it's like, well, no, I want to control everything. Yeah. And when you do that and when a lot of things are wrong, it's not really, it's not unfair that everybody gets very, very angry at you personally. It's kind of inviting the criticism. So if you make the club about yourself and the club isn't performing well, Kind of what you expect to happen next. So, some sympathy, but I, yeah, not a huge amount. Another thing we talked about in the video with Paddy and that the Everton thing is about the strategic review they were going to do because they said Marcel Brands is now gone, so he was in charge of a lot of the recruitment and that sort of part of the club. So they're going to have a strategic review. Was it at the end of the season? I think now. Now, so they're doing yeah. it now, right? So the strategy is this clearly is probably part of that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> getting rid of Benitez. Yeah. <laughs> so they they have to get what their strategy, what their five year, ten year, twenty year plan, or whatever it is. And you can look at this is not like the best way to do it, but you can look at the managers they've had in and like win percentages and see there's they change the manager and nothing changes. They bring new players and nothing changes. Ronald Koeman was fired in October 2017 with a 41.4 percent win percentage win mm-hmm. ratio, whatever you yeah. call it. So Allardyce came in, so that's a change in strategy completely. So Allardyce, a different coach entirely to Ronald Koeman. Different um, players he brought in as well. Different players just to try and survive. They, so he rescued them, then he was, uh, they pinged him off and he was like 38.4%. So roughly 40% kind of win ratio, we dragged them in. Then it was Marco Silva, it might be more progressive, more of an exciting young coach. Again, a pivot from Allardyce, that's 40% win rate again. Then Carlo Ancelotti is the highest they've had. Mm-hmm. I don't think even he was completely loved and people didn't think that he had... We had a great start to, to his first season. Things dropped off towards the end. But yeah. they were very exciting at the beginning of last season. Well, I say, but it takes so much, so long. You think of how long mm-hmm. it took Jurgen Klopp to... I mean, this, Klopp at Liverpool slowly got them up. You know, yeah. it took him a while, like three years before they started. He won things as well, but he's... I mean, he is probably an outlier. Sure. But it's the thing, you had Carlo Ancelotti, who is now the current Real Madrid manager. So mm. obviously quite a high caliber. Wasn't beloved. He was 46.2 win percentage, uh, percentage win rate. Benitez has left in 31.8. So he's fairly dropped off. Sure. So you can see that's probably not, he's not hitting his targets so he can get binned. But unless there's that coherent strategy where they know what they can allow to, like when they can allow themselves to lose, how long they know it's going to be before they can get to a certain place. They can't keep doing this thing where they bring a manager in and they lose. Like Benitez won five in a row now. That would increase straight away and he'd look yeah. far better. They're not going to, they just always get someone in who gets into 40% roughly sure. of winning. And so they're always trapped in mid table. Well, speaking of bringing someone in and as part of the strategic review as well, um, it's possible that by the time the podcast is released, they will have appointed someone. We're, we're not sure. It sounds like the sort of appointment that might take a little bit longer. The three or four names currently. Uh, that uh, you know, filling the the, the reports and the rumours. Roberto Martinez is uh, is um, top of the odds at the moment, which is an interesting one, given that I believe he was the first manager that Fahad Mashiri fired when he came <laughs> in. I might might have got that wrong, but it's around that time. 
Um, uh, other than that, Wayne Rooney is another name which is, is being mentioned for obvious reasons. Duncan Ferguson, again, for obvious reasons. Graham Potter is there or thereabouts, but I think that's because he occupies that position within managerial vacancy odds for every team. Um, is certainly a manager, I'm sure people listening, uh, regular listeners will know, we would encourage Everton to, 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 to seek out. Um, but Seb, based on what JJ is saying there, do you feel like now is quite a difficult time to pick a new manager or is it is it a good time given that they're theoretically in the middle of a strategic review and we'll have some ideas about where they will want to go? It would, it would have been better if this happened a couple of months down the line or in the summer, wouldn't it? Yeah, I think so. Also, my problem with the strategic review is, is that a strategic review being carried out by all the people that are responsible for the bad decisions that have made, been made in the past? Well, because Or as an external? Because my point being is that a lot of things have to happen really before Everton appoint a new manager mm. and yet Everton need a new manager because it's the middle of the season. They need one now. It yeah. feels, yeah, and, and also you, I, I think I think that that's a, that, that problem's sort of underlined by the names on that list because those are four very, very different people. Also Chuck Duncan Ferguson there as an interim, potentially another different person. Mm. So there's no real commonality between them. And whilst you could argue a case for all of them, uh, except Martinez, I just don't think. I think that's exactly the same situation repeating itself. He'd come in, a section of the fan base would hate him instinctively from the start because of what happened before. People who don't remember the Martinez reign, like Goodson Park got pretty toxic towards the end of it and it was very, very inhibiting for those players to play in. Yeah. And it's been done. And so who's doing this thinking? Who it, it, are the, the same minds who are coming up with this list of names, if it's accurate? Are they the ones that are kind of refining all the club's processes? Because if so, I don't hold out a lot of hope for where they're going. Sure, sure. Also, you know, they're three, they're two years away from a new stadium. You're going to have a retraction of ambition in that situation, just because that is what it it's like when you're you're kind of going through that bridging period. Mm. At the very least, people need to understand what you're trying to do as a supporter. You want to buy into. A direction even even if it's not going to end in a champions league final you need to be able to understand what the club is doing and where it's going and how it's going about that you need to it's like in maths remember when you 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 know teachers used to tell you to show you're working it's a little bit like that understand why you're thinking this way rather than just lurching towards this manager and we'll get this guy in and he'll he'll get us to 40 percent win ratio yeah. and and this one and and, and bin that player because this guy that we appointed six weeks ago he doesn't like him very much and we need something else and it's just I don't understand it, and that's the problem. If you don't understand it, you can't really get behind it, can you? No, for sure. It's really difficult, that job, like just trying to get the new players in, because you're going to, another manager's going to want exactly what they want. This is why they have to have have a director of football who's, they've got a set kind of way of playing and the kind of players are going to bring in. Like, are they trying to instantly get in Champions League, or are they trying to do the thing where you buy them young before they're big players and and develop them? This is the problem, because Brands' reputation was built on doing a lot with a little, but also um, in constructing youth academies or constructing youth development mm. and none of that really happened and you just think it's a kind of it, it it again it's just something which i see another situation which we don't understand why why was he brought into the club what kind of agency was he given to uh renovate finch farm all that kind of stuff i mean like um figuratively renovate i mean with talent not actually rebuild it but and he left without I mean, if you went to, to Marcel Brand's office now, it was, would there be any evidence that he was ever at the club? I, 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 do you see what I mean? There seems to have been a complete waste of time in this appointment. Yes, um, yes, indeed. It's very strange. Well, for those listeners who want to dig a little deeper, uh, I would highly recommend Greg and Paddy's writing on The Athletic and, and, and do head over to T4 IRL to watch the video that we, that we made with Paddy a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it's about 40 minutes long and there's lots of interesting detail in there that we haven't quite covered here. Yeah. Um, the team that put the boot in, Norwich City, their third win of the season there, suddenly in 18th place, 13 points. It is not now inconceivable that Norwich City do not get relegated. It is a possibility, a possibility I enjoy. Uh, Watford, of course, uh, drawing with Newcastle. We'll come to talk about that a little bit later. Um, but I thought Rashica had a good game. I thought Josh Sargent's return was, was, was important and impressive. I thought it was great that they played Everton because they're terrible at the moment. But, you know... Uh, talk about a confidence builder. It was exactly what Dean Smith needed at the right time, JJ. I mean, yes. Moving on now. Um, <laughs> Do we repeat what you said? No, the, the, that is my opinion. The reason I brought this like up was to, was to tell people again, we made a, a, a great video with Michael Bailey. It'll be going out at some point uh, this week where we talk about uh, Norwich over the course of a sort of five-year period. 
Um, uh, and so for any any Norwich fans out there, anyone interested in Norwich, uh, do come and join us. It for was the... very interesting being on the chat. that's talking to Michael about it. Sure. It was really good. Fascinating guy. Yeah. There we go. Well, anyway, uh, next up is Manchester City 1-0 Chelsea. Uh, only a couple of points here to, to, to make. Uh, the first one, uh, Seb, really is that uh, Man City have probably won now, haven't they? And I've also made the note to say JJ hates it when I say that. Uh, so I'm asking you. Yeah, I think so. I think it's kind of worrying if you look at those two games between City and Chelsea, just how easy it's been for City. That's kind of kind of worrying, yeah. isn't it? But yeah, yeah. for sure. Nowhere back. Really. Okay. The only other point here, uh, JJ. Sorry, now that we know that, lose it. now that we know that they've won it already, um, you know, go on, do your bit. Fine. Have you go. Well, if see, Man City play Liverpool and they lose to Liverpool, and then Man City do that thing where they lose to Crystal Palace weirdly, uh-huh. and draw with two other teams because they just can't score because they're defending so well. Sure. And Liverpool win all their games. It's still on. I don't know. I'm what just, you're saying is uh, mathematically, it's not finished. That's what you're saying. I'm wondering whether it's because. Um, you English lads in your Premier League have mm. been used to having... I mean, it was always Man United used to win stuff all the time, and that was boring mm. so it was every single year. But now mm-hmm. I guess it breaks up a little bit with City and Liverpool and whatever. The thing is, there's only really two precedents uh, yeah. for, 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 for the, uh, a situation this severe at this uh-huh. stage in the season. And both of them were 20 years ago. Mm. So I think it's extremely unlikely. It's possible, of course. Well done, Mr. Maths. But I think it's also fine at this point to say Man City have very likely won. I think and it's, it's be- extremely unlikely that they won't win. Yeah, but what I was going to say is that because I'm so used to watching um, Scottish football and Scottish Premiership where mm. it is only literally one or two teams yeah. who can ever win it. Yeah, I've grown used to um, finding the optimism in these small places sure, sure. and enjoying it. Also, City won't be like this forever. Like once Guardiola leaves, it will go back to being yeah. far more uh, even. And also they play brilliant football and are really interesting to watch. Yeah. So I think it's... All reasons why yeah. they've probably won. Um, a, a note on uh, Chelsea, though. Uh, I was a little frustrated with some of the commentary around the game, JJ, uh, watching that at home. Repeatedly hearing suggestions that Lukaku needs to hold the ball up better and that the team need to lump it up to him, words to that effect. Uh, I just sort of wanted you to make the point here stringently. Lukaku's not a target man. Not to say he couldn't have played better in that game or can't be a better player, but it's just to entirely misunderstand how he plays. Yeah, he's not a target man. I don't, I mean, the commentary wasn't saying they should be pumping up just to him. They were trying to get him in behind to stretch the play. I've riled myself up. Don't, don't try to rile well, me back down no, let's be, let, me, let me get all in a rage about in it. In real life, this is what actually, so Lukaku's hold up play should have been better in that game because the, like he wasn't holding up the ball. He's losing the, but like mm-hmm. Tuchel said after the game, he was losing it with, under no pressure a couple of yeah. times. There's one time he was actually fouled, so it's not his fault. Sure. Um, but this is the, the thing that when he, like when he's involved in the game constantly, his, it's like he gets used to the touch of the ball and then he's really good at it. But if he's now and again, sometimes gets touches, that's when it seems to let him down and he, that little first touch will be loose or he won't quite see what he's doing. Yeah, He was making a lot of the right runs constantly in this game, trying to break in behind. And the strategy was clearly to um, keep the ball, like pass it out from the back, um, not because they were obsessed with possession. Steve McManaman's commentary in this was infuriating. Yeah. Like, the, the reason that Chelsea were trying to play out from the back is to draw City onto them, even though they're trying to press them, because then it moves their defensive line up higher, which means you can then get Lukaku in behind. Run behind yeah. But they were trying to release him from halfway. There's no point booting it long over the top. Mm. Then it's just a race. And like, yeah. like Walker would be able to beat him, even with a head start. Like, Lukaku's really fast, but I bet Walker yeah. could accelerate. Well, also, Edison's basically on the, you know, in, this, in the semicircle in the middle, right? Yeah, I mean, that's, but that's just, yeah, I mean, that's, that is a thing. Thing. But if they can get him away, then that's the thing. But there is like Pulisic, his decision making. He's got if he's, if you're a football manager, his vision would be like twelve because mm. he just kept not seeing the yeah. ball forward. And it's not even like they're being safe. Is that he just didn't spot the pass because yeah. he's not that kind of player. Mason Mount probably would have spotted that, and that's why you'd have played Mount rather than Pulisic in that example. So Z- about, Ziyech felt a little bit off the pace as well. Some of his passes were literally wasn't fast enough. He was yeah. more of a he's more of a possession player, and I guess you want to have players like that. So you put. Pulisic on because he's fast and getting behind. That's why he's there. Yeah. And rather than Werner, because Werner has repeatedly proven that he misses his chances and like he was, a, he didn't contest a header properly for the. In fact, even look at why they're playing out from the back. The I mean, Manaman kept going on and on and on about how they need to, to boot the ball clear, and get it in behind. Um, I don't think it's to try and get Lukaku on it to hold it up. It's more just to get them in behind, like I said. But you saw it from the goal. Like Foden was pressing. This is a really good piece by Michael Cox actually in the Athletic today. Um, Foden keeps pressing from the front. So even though he wasn't involved much on the ball, Foden's out of possession work 
was how City basically won that game. Because him constantly chasing down Saar and Silva and the goalkeeper uh, rushes them. And you saw that Kepa's... So I think it was the lowest um, passing accuracy from a goalkeeper all mm. season for Chelsea. They're normally at like 80 or 90% roughly, whether it's Mendy or Kepa. Like Kepa's good in the ball as well. Um, but because of the way that they were getting harried, they were rushing it. And so the one time, one of the one times they didn't commit to passing out from the back and playing through a really risky press, which would then allow them to turn over and get the ball in behind to win the game, uh, they, Kepa booted it. Then Werner doesn't win his header. So again, kind of an annoying thing for Tuchel to have watched because you'd want maybe Lukaku to in that position to try and win the header, but it's the poor clearance. And then City come forward and because Chelsea then have to readjust, they're in transition. So if you're constantly booting it, you're in transition from defensive to attack, attack to defense. There's no set formation. There's no set shape. So you're trying to adjust and that's when you get the small little bits where like De Bruyne then skips past someone mm -hmm. and then there's a space for him to shoot, which wouldn't normally be there. They're in possession. So that's why they weren't doing it. And it's just, I don't understand why. And McManaman as well. I don't want to have it, like lay the boot into like one of the best players that England have had. Get him. But he always does. He either says you need to pass out from the back constantly, or he says you need to be clear in your lines. And it's whichever one isn't working at the time with no appreciation for why a team is doing it. Like you think Thomas Tuchel it doesn't know that like he thinks, why would he set the team up to do this? It's clearly on purpose because of the strategy to win the game. Otherwise you're just booting it with no control of it. it Thomas really Tuchel did also say after the game, it, it was a close game. And it's probably a fair description of it. I, I think there were several incidents, several, maybe too many, at least one or two where if the pass to Lukaku through had been better or if Lukaku had, had better taken his chance, yeah. there, Chelsea did have opportunities to score. They didn't have a huge amount of XG, but there were opportunities to well, score so you in this game. Because you match prep, because you yeah. work out how you're going to... So you, when you're match prep, you're going to do like, how are we going to score? How are we going to stop them scoring? Yeah. And the way you're going to score... The game against... could have been 1-0 the other way. It could exactly. have been 2-1. Like it, it, the, the, There were opportunities to win. I feel like the, um, the suggestion that they need to entirely change their strategy... Uh, Was that suggested? No, no, no. I'm oh. not, not based on you. I'm just saying, like M McManaman saying that they need to clear their lines. Maybe if 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 they literally not escaping their 18 yard box at all, and City are just scoring over and over again, then sure, try something completely different. But the point I'm making is they could have won the game with the chances that they had. They just didn't yeah. take them. And so and it's not like it wasn't working. That's what it was supposed to look like. And you don't want to give City the ball. No. Is the whole point. If you clear it, you don't have the ball. Like, the opposition can't score if you have the ball. Mm. Well, I mean, there was what was the goal on the weekend that Liverpool scored against Brentford? That's an example. Sure, sure. <laughs> you think it's Michael Keane also thinks differently, I, yes. I think. Um, but this, this is the thing. So you want to keep the ball against Man City. because, And also, sometimes when you win the ball, you don't want to go forward straight away because you've been chasing it and pressing them for about two minutes at a time. It's mm, exhausting. You're tired. So you keep it and you pass it around to gain some control. You, you need that your 60 energy. seconds to recover your exactly. breath before you Get your you tempo back, again. then you can up it, and then you yeah. start looking for it. And the most likely way to get Lukaku in is not a long, high ball over the top. It's a flat one that you can drill from around about halfway between defenders sure which you can do once they've pushed up yeah and, and what they did was exactly how you could have beaten them like he has beaten them before in the champions league final this is the yeah. thing not it, that long ago yeah it works it 100 sure. works but you can't win every single game just because you didn't win doesn't mean you got the plan wrong no of course of course indeed it annoyed me well there we go that's uh probably the end of this part i would have thought we'll be back after this part for another part and we're back. Time to talk about AFCON now. Oh, exciting. Uh, round two, of course, is over there, Seb. And there were some interesting fixes. W worth saying, because we haven't spoken about this uh, for a week now. Worth saying, very strange round one, wasn't it? Every game was either decided by uh, one goal, no more than one goal in any game, was there? Uh, and there was a couple of nil-nils, and they said very low scoring. Was that just, uh, you know, first uh, for every team, first game of the tournament, no one wants to lose it? Uh, I felt like a couple of things. I think when I was watching, I tried to watch as much as possible, and I overriding impression was of um, quite a lot of the COVID disruption on teams, and you could see where perhaps a couple of players have been dropped into important positions, and some of the kind of functionality of the teams have been lost as a result. So, and I, I this is a little bit of a generalisation, but the pitches are very, very dry, very, very dry. Mm. Very hot and, and a lot humid. Of, yeah. Very hot and humid, very bumpy. Also, there's a lot of European-based players in the. Um, in the tournament who would be used to a kind of slicker surface. And I think that's had a little bit of an effect too. Plus, of course, let's be fair, it's the, the first round of a tournament and it's not as if we haven't seen World Cups and European Championships where the priority is just not to lose. Sure. And I think we've seen some pretty cautious football and teams who don't want to, especially with the third place uh, qualifying option, 
who don't want to put themselves out of contention right from the start. Yeah, yeah. So um, well, it's also, a mixture I mean, of all round, round two opened up delightfully. The first game of round two, Cameroon, Ethiopia, 4-1. Cameroon uh, certainly on their yeah. way through to the to the second rounds now. Nigeria also beating Sudan, 3-1. Uh, Tunisia beat Mauritania, 4-0 as well. So there were big, big, uh, big scores in round two. Um, an outstanding result from from last night. We should uh, say that we're recording this on a Monday, so there will have been the first few games in, in round three will have played by the time you're listening. Uh, but at the moment, the last game to have played was Algeria, Equatorial Guinea. Algeria losing that game. Currently, bottom of their group. Uh, these are uh, holders, of course. Um, mm-hmm. A little a little scary after two games to be uh, bottom of Group E with one point, Seb. Yeah, well, it was actually, it was an evening of shocks because Ivory Coast got held by Sierra Leone. Mm. And JJ and I were talking about this just before the podcast started. There's a terrible error from Ivorian goalkeeper Ali Sangari when he goes to prevent a goal kick, uh, goes to prevent a corner from running off. And uh, he, I'm not even sure how you describe what happens. He sort of, he gets himself in a very awkward position, forces himself to fumble the ball and then uh, Sierra Leone score. I think it's the pitch, but, though. I think it's because the... The maybe, maybe. You can see how dry the pitch is and normally you'd slide when you catch it. So he, it's, he's running towards his own goal yeah. line, but he's about 10 yards wide of the goal. And then um, it catches it absolutely perfect and goes to ground, but then there's no, like he can't move. There's too much friction against him. So it sort of makes him adjust yeah. and he bounces the ball loose. Mm. If it had been a, like a, a wet pitch, it would have been absolutely fine. Um, on, on that note, just a bit of temperature and stuff, but there was a referee got heat stroke in one of the games. It is yeah. mega hot, so no wonder it's a lot slower and a bit more cautious. In fact, that, that was the game, apparently, or at least uh, I, the I heard this 85th on the... 85th minute. Yeah, on this yeah. Stadio podcast yeah. that we were talking about, that, that was the game um, where the game ended at 85 well, minutes and they came back out and went back in again and came back out. It was that referee who apparently was suffering well, from well, the sunstroke. <laughs> Thanks, please. Makes some sense. Well, the, the referee ended up in hospital afterwards, so obviously oh, like, we wish him the best. But there was... I tell you what, the um, I, I'm really I've been surprised by Nigeria. Obviously, they had a coaching change six weeks before the tournament. Yeah. Well, Nigeria top, of, top, top of Group D, uh, six points. Uh, Egypt, of course, a second in that group with uh, with three. Mm-hmm. We'll probably look to see them uh, go through. Mo Salah scoring one goal in, the, in that most most recent game as well. But Nigeria, fantastic team. Yeah, I've also I um, I was watching that game, their, their second round game, and um, Moses Simon, uh, who was who was a player that I kind of was associated with just being kind of dynamic and uh, aggressive with the ball at his feet and a bit of a kind of self-indulgent dribbler, if that makes sense. Yeah. He's been great. He's been fantastic. Joe Rebo, Rangers Joe Rebo has had a great tournament too. He's a really too. good player he's at been, that point. He's really good. He looks it. He's, I, I've been really impressed by the way that he's dealt with some of the surfaces. He looks so elegant on the ball and so composed. And he's he's not um, he's not going to be one of those guys that finishes the tournament with a whole load of flattering stats because a lot of what he does doesn't really register in that way. But he's he's... He's where he needs to be all the time. Yeah. It's a really precious, precious ability. And uh, yeah, so he's been great. Um, uh, Kelechi and Nacho scored a fantastic goal. But yeah, Moses Simon, he he's kind of playing. I suppose Nigeria described him as a bit of a sort of 4-2-2. Um, two, even. Yeah, they need um, another two in there somewhere. <laughs> need another two in there somewhere. And he's playing sort of from the left-hand side, kind of in diagonally towards the penalty box. And he's been great. His distribution's been good. His carrying's been good. He is attacking the back post when Nigeria get forward on the right side too. They look great. They look great. I, I feel like I'm falling into a trap because there's always, whenever a tournament starts, there's always that early runner that everybody falls in love with sure. and starts saying, oh, yeah, they're going to... I'm not they're sure they're the going to win the tournament. But um, they've been great. Two really, really comprehensive, convincing performances so far. Tell so me a little about Senegal because, of course, they, they, they beat Zimbabwe in their first game only through a, a, an extremely late penalty. Drawn nil nil against Guinea too. I mean, the top of the group and, the, and almost certainly will will go through, um, but they haven't quite hit the pace that at least yeah. I was expecting them to before the tournament started. Yeah, they look badly underprepared, and they've obviously been hit by COVID before the tournament started, mm. uh, and it shows. Kulabali so they got very and lucky. Are out, aren't they? Yeah. Also, they got very lucky against Zimbabwe. I, it was a very very contentious penalty. It Probably was so a penalty. Harsh. I thought it was absolutely. It was very very unlucky. That. Just watch it. It's Zimbabwe in centre half trying to make a block, and it just caught his trailing hand. This was—I um, don't know what's the right way to describe it. So they were a little bit better, but I felt like Guinea defended better. Mm. So as a Guinea played a kind of, I'd say probably you know, different times back three, back five. You got a central defender called Mohamed Kamara who was great against Sadio Mane. So there were a couple of times when the two best chances that. Um, 
uh, Senegal created were sort of as a result of mistakes. And both times, the first one, Mane twists and turns in the box. Kamara gets a really well-timed leg in. He's about six foot four, six foot five. So he's a big leggy guy who you think is going to it's going to struggle with uh, forwards who have a low centre of gravity. But he did a brilliant job there. Also, um, Mane broke clear, but and he had just uh, Kamara between him and the goal. And um, he kind of took him down the left side. And do you remember the the very, very famous Bobby Moore tackle on Jarzinho, mm. uh, where he kind of, he times it, times it, juts a leg out and takes the ball completely cleanly. I'm not saying that um, Mohamed Kamara is another Bobby Moore, but it looks exactly like that. It's that kind of dynamic where it's just a great bit of defending. And on Sadio Mane, who I, I accept is a little bit off form, but it's still Sadio Mane. Uh, he's still one of the world's best players. And yeah. this guy was, um, he's terrific. He plays for, um, plays for, I had to look it up yesterday. He, looked, he plays for Young Boys Burn in Switzerland. Right. Um, but he looks like a, a terrific defender. Well, you know, it's, it means interesting because uh, uh, Guinea-Bissau uh, defended extremely well against Mo Salah in Egypt as well. I mean, there's, you know, one yeah. thing we can say about the tournament so far, a little edgy in that first round as, as already described, but a lot of good defending. Like the, the excellent players that are there are not tearing the tournament up as you might expect them to. I mean, there's like the good systems in place and lots of, um, there's been lots of solid system defending to watch. Yeah, lots, lots of good defending, lots of good fullback play too. Mm. So I felt like key to, to Cameroon's much improved performance in um, in the second round was Collins Fire had a great game. Uh, everyone will know his two assists. He, he created the first and the second goal, two brilliantly floated balls, uh, which uh, just begging to be put away. But also I liked the kind of tactical cohesion he played with. Like he was, the runs he made down the right and the willingness he uh, showed to run into space kind of key to Cameron's ability to plot their way out the field so if you if you look back at the second goal and you see the um as a ball through I think by Eric Chupa um it's Collins Fire making that run um that kind of creates the passing avenue which leads to the chance which ends up in the goal and I feel like there's been a lot of fullbacks who have done that in the tournament and that's been key perhaps to the tournament settling down into a little bit more rhythm especially amongst the better sides a couple of them still are misfiring we talked about Algeria talked about Senegal Yes, but uh, some of that is where some some of those dynamics are where the class is showing. Mm. Um, Collins Fire looks like a great player. Yeah. I, I I don't know almost anything about him, but um, well, we he should was, say uh, he was terrific. Oh, yes, well, we should say also anyway. I mean, the format is the same for the Euros. Uh, uh, that uh, you know, four of the, the the third place teams will go through. So I'm sure that there's an opportunity here for some of the stuttering teams, Algeria, for example, if they can win their final game, then there's uh, still very very likely to to proceed. Um, but uh, you know difficult state of affairs. Do you have an early favourite there, Seb? Who's your favourite for the tournament? I'm going Cameroon, by the way. I feel like uh, on home soil, well, dreams, it's um, what dreams are made of. <laughs> yeah, I've liked, I like Cameroon just on that Algeria point. Well, um, Algeria's last game is against the Ivory Coast. And that is, I mean, that's a horrible game to have as your, to, if, if you need to win, because the Ivory uh, Coast are talented. And as my mother um, would say, that's a toughy wuffy. She would be right. She would be absolutely right in saying that. I, I'm going to stick with Nigeria I, just because I, I like the story. I like the story. And I, I, I kind of know I'm wrong, but I've been so impressed. And there was there was so much negativity about them before the tournament began. Mm. And it's been so refreshing to see a uh, to see a, a team defeat their critics. That I, I hope it um, I hope it ends well. They always yeah. seem to be like an underperformer in Nigeria in this tournament. So hopefully hopefully they'll uh, they'll correct that this time around. Ah, indeed. Well, thank you, Seb. That's our AFCON update. We're looking forward to next week because, of course, the uh, the knockout rounds will have begun in earnest. Very exciting. Some might say the knockouts have already begun because people teams will leave. But um, that's not the technical definition. Cut that, cut that, cut that, cut that. <laughs> <laughs> Next up, of course, is uh, Aston Villa 2 to Manchester United. Swerving back to the, to the UK here. Um, Birmingham, in fact. It was an interesting game, JJ. Uh, of course, remembered... For all the reasons, 2-2. Yes. Two, two. Aston Villa came back 2-2. Two, two. I asked you, this is a game I recorded on Saturday evening because yes. I couldn't be there to watch it. I was out with some friends and I said, uh, sent a little message to the TIFO WhatsApp group saying, please no one tell me the result because I'm going to record this game and it's very boring to watch games later if, you've already, if you already know the result. I like the sort of suspense, you know, and I wanted the suspense. And uh, then what did JJ do? You text me. 
later that night to tell me what yeah. happened and then tried to pretend you were joking. But you believed it. I didn't believe he, it. He was real world annoyed about this. I was annoyed. <laughs> I spoke to him yesterday. Yeah. I was annoyed. And you know what? I, like 50% of me thought maybe it's a weird joke. It's not that funny. And he only did two. You know what actually let me, led me on to this? You just said, ha ha. I think if it was a joke, based on my angry reaction to saying, why did you tell me the result? Yeah. You would have said, ha, 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 ha. But you didn't. You very quickly tried to, you know. I little, thought that was a good little way micro subtly... thing. little micro thing. It wasn't that good. No. Well, I thought, well, and I also, thought... as soon as Man United scored two goals, I was like, right, yeah. He, I mean, he mentioned the comeback, obviously. Obviously, he was lying to me and has ruined this game. Well, Watched it anyway, and it was quite fun. Mainly, it was fun to see Coutinho, Philip Coutinho. Philip? Philippe Coutinho. Philippe. Um, you know, erstwhile Barcelona Liverpool player joining Aston Villa and having a, just a terrific time <laughs> in the middle of the uh, middle of the park there, JJ. Yeah, he came on and scored the. He almost scored the winner as well, actually. Yeah, very close. Obviously, yeah. he didn't. Um, I'm starting to think Gerard might be doing quite well with his Aston Villa team, which is good. I want I to see how long it lasts. Where it could be that they middle out, but they seem to be winning or getting points out of games you wouldn't normally expect them to. Mm. Although I guess United are a bit weak at the moment. Sure. And they're a bit in disarray, so that's maybe where it, it's not as... I don't know what I'm saying, basically. Uh, Jacob yeah. Ramsey also had a great game. Mm -hmm. I thought he was fantastic. Well, uh, there's a manager who knows how to make midfielders better, or how to play in midfield. It is Steven Gerrard. You well. <laughs> and his Jacob, 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 Rams Jacob Ramsey is fantastic. Like I, yeah, rescue it, Seb. Thank you. <laughs> I... I'm not sure what my favourite ability of his is. I think it's the way he carries the ball. He makes it. He, he does it so elegantly. Mm. He's a really great presser. He um, so the the equalising goal that Villa scored. I think this is kind of hopefully this is a tease of where they what they might be like for the rest of the season. So you've got the kind of um, the initial like move between Buendia and Ramsey, and then Coutinho coming at the back post. Lovely sort of triangle of players. The there. triangle of delight. Like mesh of yeah. ability. Triangle of delight. Absolutely. But Ramsey. Um, I, I said this, um, I think I said this on a previous podcast, but he reminds me a little bit of Adam Lallana, like a young Adam Lallana sure. in his first season when he was when he was at Southampton, first season in the Premier League. And he he does all these really nice attacking bits, but in quite a subtle, composed, yeah. um, two or three speed kind of way. And it, he's just great to watch. He's um, he's gonna he's only 20. So he, and I, I was actually talking to um, Alex Keeble on Twitter, who uh, is a really good follower for Villa fans. And he was saying that actually when um, Ramsey was younger, it was his brother who was considered the better prospect. Mm. I don't know anything about his brother. But um, yeah, so uh, he's really broken through. And he's. He, I think Villa fans themselves are surprised by his progress, but he's been, he's been absolutely great. Yeah. Okay. Adam Lallana, never think of him, ever. Don't you? No, I think he's like, you know, I like playing I think the game of him quite often. where you have to name players in the 90s that no one really remembers, but you sort of do when you hear it. Yeah. And I think Lallana would fall into that category for the, the, the tens. He might do. I don't know. I thought, I mean, it, it, you know, he was, um, he was, I really like he was a great player. He had a couple of, couple of, couple of uh, badly placed injuries and also, you know, existing as part of a Liverpool squad, badly placed, badly timed. Injuries at bad times, key times. Uh, but also as part of a, a developing, evolving Liverpool squad, which kind of no longer really had a use for him after a certain period of time. Yeah, uh, bad transfer. A different trajectory could have happened. He was a very good player. I just, yeah. I just never, ever think of him. Just remember Ricky Lambert? So if Danny Murphy wasn't on TV, you don't think you'd ever remember Danny Murphy? No, I would never remember Danny Murphy. That's the thing, it's no. one of those players. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Ricky Lambert? Yeah, good example. That's also a, went to Liverpool from Southampton, didn't he? That's a really good example of the players, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. There'd be more. I can't think of any. Well, that's the right whole now. point, isn't it? Yeah. You can't remember them. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Buendia also, I thought, had a fantastic game, Seb, just to come back to the, the triangle of delight for, for a moment. Um, I think some Villa fans were, were wondering how Coutinho and Buendia were going to play together. They seemed to do it very well for the last 20 minutes. Yeah, I mean, he had a good second half. I think Villa as a whole were pretty rubbish in the first half. Mm -hmm. But uh, what I'll say is, like, I think, I think one of the interesting things about combining Coutinho with someone like Buendia is Coutinho does the things that Buendia doesn't do quite enough of. So mm -hmm. Buendia is a lovely, skillful, creative player, but he isn't... Never on the end of the pass. Not, 
No, nah, he's not enough of a goal threat. He doesn't shoot enough. Coutinho does both of those things, yeah. which is really great. So you add the two together, and that's kind of what completes your triangle of delight. You could you could instantly see delight. as well his delight. You could instantly see as well when Coutinho came on that they were making slightly different runs. Uh, yeah. Often when the ball was played out to to, to to who's who's Aston Villa's right back? Oh, of course it's Luca Dina who we haven't. No, he's, he's left back. back. It was uh, Matty Cash. Wasn't Matty it? Cash. Matty um, Cash. They played a number of sort of you know long passes out from Matty Cash towards the end when they were pumping United, and it was very interesting to watch Coutinho's instinct is to try to make that run in behind on the line when Diaz is to come deeper for the ball so you're right it could it could be interesting uh Luca Dina of course his debut as well um what did you make of him Seb? Yeah it's good he obviously uh he obviously suffered a little bit towards the end because he, he hadn't hasn't played a lot of football recently and you mm. can see him going down with cramp a little bit I think just just to go one more time with the Coutinho thing I think it's I think Villa's problem last couple of weeks or maybe last month or so has been they've played well, haven't necessarily always got the results they needed, scored the goals. I think it's quite interesting when you add someone like Coutinho in who, regardless of what happened to him at Barcelona and Bayern Munich and towards the end of his time at Liverpool, he is a player who is used to winning big games and mm. is used to getting results in the right places. And I think that's very helpful because it, it seems a little bit psychological. So, you know, go back five days before this game, I felt Villa played Man United off the pitch at Old Trafford and somehow lost. And that's kind of a symptom of a team that are transitioning into something but haven't don't quite yeah. know what they are yet, don't have the right convictions. And I think Coutinho helps this. And it needs to come from more than just the one place, of course. But uh, I'd say it's a really necessary ingredient that yeah. they needed. I'm and, not um, saying yeah, yeah. I'm not saying this is exactly what Gerard is doing, but at, at Rangers a lot of the time. What did you say? I'm not saying this is what Gerard is doing. Oh, okay. Do you think <laughs> I, I just couldn't hear the words? Yeah. Uh, I'm not saying this is what Gerard is doing, but at Rangers, an awful lot of times what they'd have is the the four three three is more like a four three two one, and the two wide players are very narrow behind the central forward. So you can play someone like Watkins out wide, but actually he's basically a second striker and attacking mm. midfielder. Same with Wendia and Coutinho, you can have them either side of a forward, um, and it, it's like a, almost like a Christmas tree kind of shape, really. Of, you know, four three two one, um, and then the fullbacks are really important, which is why I guess he went really hard and make sure he got uh, Dini in because yeah. like, Cash oh. has got good numbers and is a decent right back target's a good player as well but Dini sure. is probably should be a step up he looks right in the shirt <clears throat> uh, as well with all of his tattoos he just Dinia. suits a villa yeah he suits a villa shirt there was that tackle he got booked for early it was looked like mm. you're pushing the foul button on FIFA sure and, yeah. <laughs> look at Dini there yeah. you go yeah loose. Uh, <clears throat> Manchester United JJ uh, good first half in fact Ralph Rangnick described this after the game as, well, parts of it, as the best performance yet under him, which is interesting given the, given the result um, and how bad they were in the second half. They just completely collapsed. It looked a lot like a confidence thing. In the first half, they, they played very well and and, um, and uh, Bruno Fernandes has sort of had a return in this game to the form uh, that we saw from him last season. Of course, scored two goals. One notable absence in the team was Ronaldo, and it seemed to have a pretty big impact. Other players like Mason Greenwood played very well in this game. Mason's a player that we haven't seen perform uh, particularly impressively at all in the last couple of months. Um, do you think it's a coincidence? Um, well, Ronaldo's had that little hip injury, right? So sure. that's why he's maybe out. There's also that interview he did, which um, pointing out the standards aren't what they should be and calling, calling out, not by name, a bunch of players. Yeah. Uh, which may have inspired some of them. For instance, Mason Greenwood, not saying he's the one being called out, but then he was superb in this game. It was great. And you see what a good player he is? Because he, he's basically a centre forward who can play in the channels, like, I don't know, like Henri used to be. He's mm -hmm. not Henri, obviously. But uh, he's really quick. He's got, I think he sees the pitch. Like, he, he his vision's really good. Like he just sees where stuff is. Can switch to play a lot and can quickly take on players inside, outside, kind of two-footed. Cavani's more of a pressing forward, which is good for the way that Ragnik wants to play. Playing Anthony Alanga is interesting as well, mm. because it tends to be like a lot of Ragnik's teams that he's either been in charge of as a manager or looking after upstairs. You play younger players. Younger players tend to have more energy. <laughs> mm. um, and they're able, you're able to mould them and make them do things that maybe older ones wouldn't. So again, if this is... Whoever Ronaldo's talking about, whether it's uh, Greenwood, Sancho, I don't know who he's talking about. Or indeed all of them. Or just all the young lads, yeah. Uh, if they're not doing the work that the manager's asking them to, then it's not going to work. Yeah. So Randnick's particular style, it relies on energy and effort and work rate. And you can put someone in like Alanga, who would be desperate just to get in the team, 
He's got his chance. So he'll work super hard. When you have players like that working really hard, Cavani always works. I mean, he, he got injured and came on and was just sprinting back as soon as he came back off, off the pitch to try and get back involved with it. Mm -hmm. like he always see with Cavani, he doesn't give up. And that's good to see, which he can, I think, feeds off. Like certain other players in the Premier League, like N'Golo Kante, you see it. When he's buzzing around trying to tackle people, other people step up and do similar. Yeah. They inspire folk around you without being a, you're not a vocal leader. You just, you know, you're a technical leader. You show yeah. someone how to do something. Yeah. And um, yeah, this is what you see. Like Fred was involved for the one of the goals he scored, I think, mm -hmm. high up. Yeah. Where he won the ball and set it up. Bruno seen... Fernandes' is second goal. Yeah. And yeah. Fred, Fred yeah, again, has, has been, um, he, yeah, he's been impressive this season under under Rangnick. I think he's, uh, when he's had the license to, to to roam forwards and snap into the tackle, he's a really vital part of the, mm -hmm. of the press. Bit of a reinvention for him. Uh, yeah, I mean, he's, it's easy to make fun of Fred because he just seems he doesn't do anything and he's expensive and whatever. Uh, he's actually a very good player. He's like, just so <laughs> exposed. Like, I think yeah. the issue for Fred was that under, under Solskjaer, McTominay and Fred were extremely exposed. McTominay, uh, this sounds like a horrible thing to say, is quite good at making it look like he's done a lot when actually he might have done the wrong thing. Oh, 100%. And yeah. Fred is more likely to try to salvage a bad situation, which I think makes it look like he's more involved in the mistake than he might be. I mean, they've just been exposed uh, by the players Teams ahead of them. Teams did target Fred. Like, Troy Deeney has spoken about how they knew that he takes too many touches, and he does. Sure, yeah. So he takes, he takes three or four touches when he needs to. He's certainly not a perfect player. No, and uh, it's the thing. So it, but the weakest part of United's team is probably that Fred Matic um, partly had there. Yeah. I'm, I'm saying Fred's a good player, but I, I mean... He's a good shuttler. Like he's good at getting from sure. end to end. He works hard out of possession. Is tidy on the ball. Uh, does take too many touches. Sure. And isn't as good as I don't know. Naby Keita at Liverpool. That sort of thing. Matic is just finished. <laughs> I mean, he's just been. Fi I mean, Seb, am I wrong? He's been finished for eighteen months. Like I, I, I appreciate. I understand why they have to have to use him because they're actually short of options in 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 those central midfield positions. But um, Matic looks like he's just waiting to retire. Yeah, he's got mobility issues, clearly. I, I think you, you can still get a use out of him, but you have sure. to accommodate him in a midfield. And United don't really have the players to kind of bank him in and provide the mobility either side of him. Nor, nor should they be willing to, because I don't think it's, I don't think that's a sacrifice worth making. But no, no he, um, I don't really see him as a factor in United's midfield. I mean, forward. it's worth pointing out, I, I, I wouldn't suggest for a moment that he doesn't try, but I think no, it's, no. I think it is, you're right, it's mobility issues, it's his age. Uh, and also, psychologically, there must be part a view that knows well, I'm not really part of this team going forwards. You know, I'm here now, I'm going to play because I'm a professional. But um, in terms of what you were describing before, having that little bit of extra, it's hard to it's hard to sort of infuse that if it's just you doing it for yourself, isn't it? Well, you have, the way Matic reads the game is one of his best points. I mean, he's part of really important league winning sides, mm -hmm. especially under Mourinho at Chelsea, wasn't it? Yeah. He was there. Uh, like he has been a very good player and you, that experience and read of the game is really important. He gets caught out most times for from not being fast enough to recover, uh, but like Michael Carrick was like that as a player. Do you know it's a similar sort of player? And I, maybe that's what they're thinking with Matic is he's a bit like Carrick, sort of, mm -hmm. but also not without the passing range. Yeah, I, I think I think Carrick's a far superior player. I like just in terms oh, no, of like technical I, I totally ability. agree. I meant right. purely in player profile, like the style. Oh, I see. Is, yeah, is yeah. What I mean, like that. That's the. I mean, if we keep forgetting that Paul Pogba is, exists, and where does he go into that team? Been injured for a long time now. Hasn't yeah, he? but where does he go in that team? What does he do? Uh, Bruno Fernandes is better when he's got space to run into behind as a 10 or like a second striker and he can take all his shots. Yeah. But if you have Fernandes and Ronaldo in the same team, I don't think that... Fernandes can't play as well as he can if he has Ronaldo in the same team because Ronaldo effectively does the same things that Bruno does, like takes shots from long range or yeah. tries something or just doesn't... Like sometimes Ronaldo would... It seems like he's being lazy or not doing anything, but he's not. He's just trying to disappear from the sight of people around him. Sure. Because he's constantly marked, right? You know he's there. You have to need to, you need to win five yards of space. So if he just looks like he's bored... Eventually, the opposition might think he's switched off, but yeah. he's not. He's constantly on it. Seems messy. I think he's bored. He's not. He's just trying to get rid of people from marking him all the time. On this note, though, uh, in uh, David Ornstein's Monday Morning Athletic column, did you read that this morning, JJ? Because it included, of course, Seb, uh, uh, details uh, of um, or, or the suggestion that Bruno, Bruno Fernandes has refused the most recent contract offer offered to him by Manchester United uh, on the basis that he would like parity with the United's highest earning players, which seems entirely reasonable to me. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, absolutely. I mean, he's probably earning less than the Manu Matic, for context. I don't know if that's quite the case, but it, it, you know, if given, I think he was on before he arrived at Manchester United. I think he was on about fifty thousand pounds a week. Yeah. Um, and no doubt he got a pay rise, but it, 
the difference between United when he's playing well and when he's not in the team or not playing well is just it's so dramatic. The kind of the argument makes itself, doesn't it? Yeah, well, in, I mean, context. They pay four hundred grand a week to Ronaldo, three seven five to De Gea. Then you've got players like Martial and lads like that who are on two hundred grand a week and stuff. I mean, <laughs> it's pretty astonishing the amount of money they spend. Hey, on it. that Martial situation is very very strange. So, like Rennick before the game said that, uh, or after the game, sorry, said yeah. that he had declined the opportunity to be on the bench and that's why he was well, he'd left asked out. not to be in the squad, right? Yeah, and uh, on Instagram, Anthony Martial said, "Oh no, I would never refuse to play." And Who's it's lying? Always, what do you think? This this is the thing. This the, I mean, I, I'm not sure we can say that, but this is why that this situation is interesting because um, someone has to be lying, which mm. makes it very very strange. Uh, yeah. We know that Anthony Martial wants to leave the club and is um, might be going to Sevilla apparently, but right. uh, yeah, that's a strange career. That's I'd, like kind to see, of, I'd like to see Martial leave and um, and do well somewhere because I mean, he's obviously he seems to me whenever I watch him to be a confidence player, and it's a bit of a cliche. But um, one of the things that he was so good at was taking on five players. I mean, I, I remember the, when he first league. arrived at Manchester United, scored that goal against Liverpool. I don't know if you guys remember that, but it was a, a very acute angle. It was in a big, important game. I think it was the, you know, it was the winning goal that took it to 2-1. To um, and he, yeah, he took on about five players before he got there. Uh, I haven't seen him try to do that for a few years. I mean, I feel like uh, if, if he could find somewhere... Uh, where so the coach and place. the players trusted him. Yeah, and I Honestly, mean, that, that would be great because he, he has a really high ceiling. Yeah, well, also, Sevilla have been crying out for forward. They've had some serious injury issues at the top of the pitch. You put him into that side with players like Jean Jordan and even Rakitic behind him, good pair of uh, like wide players as well there. Like That's a really well-coached football team, um, yeah. Julian Lopetegui. I think he would do brilliantly. I, I mean, I, I'm interested to see if he would play as a number nine there. As in, sure. it's not quite a number nine in that system, but whether he'd be used as the kind of the the centerpiece of the attack, because that's not a role he's ever really. We well, did that a bit under Solskjaer much. at the beginning of. Did um, he? Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, I, I think, and they they had sort of there was a bit of half of the season where uh, Rashford and Martial interchanged in the nine role. It felt like Solskjaer was experimenting with that a little bit. None of them, neither of them, really worked there. All that's worth saying, Martial was better in the nine role than than Rashford was, I think. But um, anyway, that's the end of this part of the conversation. We'll be back shortly after after a break to talk about uh, Newcastle, Watford, Wolves, Southampton, um, and a few other things from around the globe. Ah, we have returned. Newcastle won, won Watford. Um, this was a very interesting game, Seb, and such an important game at the bottom of the table. It's a great game. So it's one of those which started with it's an atrocious atmosphere, two teams getting stuck right into each other within minutes of the game beginning. Yeah. John Joe Shelby getting booked after six minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I the one thing is, uh, Newcastle played okay, but even Chris Wood started, Kieran Trippier started, and there are a few suggestions that might be a little bit of a, you know, combination between those two going forward with Trippier's passing from out wide, set pieces. Chris Wood was very combative and aggressive and, you know, mm. decent aerially. He was a challenge. Watford dealt with them quite well. Watford dealt with them quite well. They've got a, um, they had a, a sort of a, a pretty ropey 20 minutes where they gave up a couple of chances from set pieces. Shellington might have scored two, didn't, certainly should have scored the second chance. The worry that I have is that, first of all, uh, the dependence on Anson Maxman, because for all of that kind of huff and puff, it was another Sir Maxman moment which created yeah. the goal. Uh, also, they never killed Watford off. Watford were never out of this game. And when they equalised, terrific header though it was. Really brave header from João Pedro. Yeah. If you look, if you see great him, goal, it's, uh, by the way. it's one really of yeah, great goal. player that can very easily get hurt challenging for that kind of ball. But he, he won it. Great header, great equaliser. But you could just feel all the momentum go out of the stadium when it went in. And I don't know. I, I don't think Newcastle are anywhere close to having done enough in the transfer market yet. They're still. They have. Chris Wood makes them better. Kieran Trippier makes them better. But they're still a bad team who yeah. needs a lot more. So, I mean, what have we got? 13 days of window left in that, um, you know, as of today. So, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. And you could also see when, after the equaliser went in, the camera cut to Eddie Howe and you could just see by his expression. You just think, because yeah. that was the chance. And with Norwich winning as well, this was a chance to move above Watford, leapfrog out of the relegation zone. Didn't take it. And... 
Huge yeah. few days for Watford as well, we should say, because uh, I think yeah. they play Norwich on Friday. They, they've got Burnley coming up in the next couple of weeks as well. It's a big time. Um, but uh, JJ, before we move on, uh, Chris Wood, you thought this was a this was a good signing? Uh, yeah, it makes perfect sense. We did a video of it again on T4IRL talking about, we can, you can, rather than me describe it, you can see it mm. in the video form. But they're describing how it's not just to try and get someone on the end of crosses, it's also allows Newcastle to get more quickly from back to front um, so they can skip the midfield part, essentially. Like we were talking about with Lukaku earlier, Chris Wood actually is a target man, and so he can take the ball down, either flick it on or control it. And um, just on Watford as well, they, they've got every game for them is very difficult because they're struggling. But they also, I think it's like three of their key players have gone to AFCON. Yes. So they've managed yeah. to keep Dennis, obviously, which is massive. If you're scoring all their goals, but they've lost Saar, who's one of their best players, uh, Truth to Kong, Kong yeah, and centre back, and Messina, who's their first choice left back. Mm. So, so like, they've signed a couple of players too, though. Like I, I, I was really taken by um, performance of Edo Kiembe in midfield. He, they signed him from Belgium. Mm -hmm. He made his debut here. He had a good game. He, he worked really well with um, Mrs. Sissoko in that midfield three. Uh, also, a, a centre half called Samir, who uh, I think is at Udinese, obviously the kind of someone within the Pozo family. Yeah. Um, but he uh, he was very very good too, and he had a he had a difficult. He was kind of complicit in that difficult first twenty minutes, but he settled down and he did pretty well against Chris Wood, given that uh, that's a little bit of a rude awakening on your debut to play against your you know eight foot six centre centre forward. Yeah. Um, but he was yeah. he was pretty good. He was Not pretty good. Yeah, so I, talk about the deep end. Yeah, for sure. So I feel confident saying that Watford have got a little bit better and they look, uh, they, they were pretty, um, you know, this was this was kind of far removed from the brittle performances they gave before Ranieri got there. I think this was, yes. um, this was pretty You can see thing. that dripping in. I mean, uh, what yeah. we talked about about six weeks ago is coming to, to fruition now. Yeah. The gap between 17th and 16th is now five points. It really does seem that those four teams currently are adrift and three of them will go down. Um, as I said, Watford have some huge games coming up, uh, Norwich City and Burnley in the next few. So they'll be ones to watch out for because uh, these could be deciders for um, for the relegation battle. One other point I wanted to make, quick note before we move on from, from Newcastle. I don't know if either of you saw Newcastle's tweet to announce the wood transfer. But they have, but the, they've got wood. The tweet reads, we've got wood with the strength arm emoji, you know? In reference, of course, to um, trees. Did you did you see the Man United tweet about Donny van der Beek? Donny van der Beek. No. It was like the classic eyeballs moment on you know, social media erections. engagement. What did they, they say? Uh, <laughs> so uh, after his substitute appearance in sort of the 94th minute over the weekend, they sent out a tweet uh, on Sunday saying something like, um, you know, Congratulations on 50 appearances for Man United with Donny van der Beek. It's like, if that totals 100 minutes, I'd be surprised. And you can Christ. just, you can see the social media team thinking about it, being, oh, that's a great tweet. Because, you know, everyone will get angry about it. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah. okay, great. Well done. Very clever. I drink I, the I felt, anger. I, I felt it was a bit disrespectful, actually, not to be pious sure. about it, but it's a player struggling. It's a very, very front and centre conversation that never yeah. goes away. And it's a little bit mocking. I just mm. thought, I don't know. I'm not sure if I was the player, I'd appreciate that so much. But maybe I'm sure. wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm just being an old man. I don't know. Well, thank goodness you're not a player. How would we thank cope? I yeah. Wolves three one Southampton. A um, little bit of appreciation here for James Ward Prowse, JJ. I don't know if you saw the highlights from this game. Yes. Yeah. That free kick goal, which is number twelve, incidentally, second now in the all-time free kick direct free kick goal scoring players, just behind David Beckham, who's on something like nineteen. I don't know. Uh, what a goal! It's My astonishing. goodness me, it's so good. The technique is—I uh, just don't even know how you begin to yeah. to do it. Yeah, like that. He is so technically competent at it, at taking free kicks. The, that's from hard work, just constantly, constantly, repetitively, repetitively mm. uh, repeating the same thing over and over again to try and yeah. to try and learn it. But it's not even—he doesn't curl it. He's not knuckleballed it either. He just hit it in such a way that it does swerve away, but like that mm. Roberto Carlos Latoma yeah. thing away into the corner but he's also going straight through it so it's just knowing exactly where the ball needs how the ball needs to spin to go in the, the net that way yeah also how to deceive the goalkeeper from that far out well wow. and crazy like, i mean who's better than him like juninho perman buchanan is like the all-time best um talking Mihailovic, to maybe in the behind, behind Mihailovic, yeah, he was decent. yeah yeah i mean 
Messi's quite consistent with it, but um, I'd say he's quite up there. Beckham was good, but I mean, we're uh, as part of some of the things we're doing Tifo IRL, we've been talking about some free kick stuff with someone who does free kick coaching. And uh, there are some players that you wouldn't expect that appear in this list of actually technically good. Players like Ronaldo appear in the genuinely technically bad uh, category, just hitting the ball into the wall. But James Ward Prowse is one of the ones that's mentioned as being one of the uh, currently in the world, like one of the best. Yeah. And he probably is one of the best in the world. It's sure. Absolutely big, fantastic. Like a, not the Southampton aren't a big team. I'm not, trying mm. to, I'm not trying to throw shade on Southampton. No, they're a small team. For yeah. Sure. yeah. Yeah, they're small. Uh, if he played for Juventus, you'd be mm. going. He's the best kick taker in the world because he probably is. Yeah. So that's to say that he is. Also, captain of that team, you know. Uh, just, a re- just a solid ind- player. Indispensable to Southampton, let's say. Yes. Well done to you, James Ward Prowse. Um, Seb, Adama Traore. Well done to Adama Traore as well for scoring uh, for the first time. Southampton did lose 3 1, by the way. Mm. So, you know. Um, Adama Traore scoring for the first time since May. I believe it's uh, 21 games without a goal. Finally got one there, Seb. He had a good opportunity, which he missed. Second one, of course, he put in too. Um, it's a funny one. I, when I think about uh, Dharma Traor, you know, like a season or two ago when he had that that, that superb run, uh, everyone was ta- talking about him as a player that could, could go anywhere. Um, what do you think? He's going to leave Wolves at some point, isn't he? What do you think now? Yeah, well, I think he's probably going to end up at Spurs in the next couple of weeks by all accounts from the... the oh, I didn't know team. that. Yeah. So supposedly uh, he is someone that Antonio Conte wants to play at right wing back. So we shall see. I, 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 as we've always said with Adama Traore, I feel like he is... His level of performance is obviously going to be dependent on confidence. Um, also, it's, it's got to be remembered that he's had a kind of the destabilising effect of a contractual situation in the background. Last, has last has he indeed, years. right? Yeah, so it's been very, very tricky. Um, also, Wolves have been through some flux themselves of a side. They, he was a, a he was a critical piece of an attacking unit which has been dismantled first by Diogo Jota's sale to Liverpool, but then by Raúl Jiménez's long-term injury, his head yeah. injury. Yeah. So, but then, depending on how you use him, um, he's a very, very effective player. I remember thinking I was watching when he, when he missed that first chance and the second came round. You just thought. No, you're not going to take that. So it's nice to see him actually, um, you know. It was an important goal, for sure. It sure was, and it um, it was important for Wolves. But Wolves are, tell you what, Wolves are great. Wolves yeah. are absolutely great. Bruno Large has done a wonderful job at Wolves. It probably doesn't, there's, there's different pieces to it. I, I You're talking about James Ward-Prowse, and um, that free kick beat Jose Sarr, obviously, and I think Jose Sarr has been a wonderful signing. I was going to say he's this. He's a terrific yeah. goalkeeper. He's a, um, he's the he's the goalkeeper that's impressed me the most uh, certainly yeah. over the last six weeks in the Premier League. I think he's better goalkeeper. He's done, than he's done enough Patricia. also to catch uh, catch the eyes of commentators. I know that I don't mean that to sound like a negative thing, but I feel like if you're a, if you're a new goalkeeper from somewhere else, you have to do a lot to capture <laughs> the eyes of the commentators. Uh, you know, on, uh, on Sky Sports, they all seem to be waiting for him to make his next wonder save, which is nice fun. Um, of course, Wolves are eighth place at the moment, 31 points from 20 games. Very impressive. Uh, just one point behind Manchester United. There you go. Well done, Wolves. Now, Seb, tell us about the very strange uh, incident with Joanne Jordan uh, in the in the Sevilla derby, Real Betis versus Sevilla. Real Betis did win this game in the end, and it was a, it's a cup tie, of course, as well. But it was split across two days. What happened? So, Sevilla went one up. This game was played in Betis. Uh, at Betis' stadium even. Um, and Betis equalised when Nabil Fakir scored directly from a corner. Obviously not the point, but amazing goal. Really strange goal, but really well-struck corner. And then from behind the goal, a what looked like a metal pipe was thrown and it hit Jean Jordan directly on the head, causing him to collapse and the game to be abandoned. Um, it's one of the situations where the referee calls the players off the pitch and you, you get the kind of behind the scenes footage of various club executives arguing in the tunnel and people remonstrating with the referees yeah. and officials. Uh, but uh, Jean Jordan is okay. So well, he, he went, went to hospital. hospital and he was he fine. I mean, there were some out. suggestions uh, from, from, you know, people there that maybe, maybe he was, maybe he was all right, you know? Uh, I don't know. Like, I, I don't know what... I mean, I, I, I saw the incident, I saw the pipe, but I'm not sure what the... Um, I, I, I was told it was a plastic pipe. Maybe, but then um, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you remember what it's like to throw plastic over a great distance... Do I remember? A, <laughs> well, do you know what it's like? Like if you're, if, you're, if you're throwing a heavy object, it's a lot easier to be more accurate. 
Uh, yeah. I'm not sure. A, a, a this guy's talking like someone flies. who really knows, isn't he? He's talking yeah. like someone who's had experience. How do you know so much about okay. pipes, Seb? Yeah. What we you doing we with do the javelin at school, and so like, when, 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 when we not throwing javelin from the start. No, it, 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 it kind of is though, because when you when you learn to throw a javelin, you first of all you do it with with plastic, kind of without the spiky bit, obviously, because yeah. that makes sense. Um, and whilst that's good for learning the technique, it's very very difficult to to get any kind of purchase on it. As well, that's about to, the aerodynamics, isn't it? That's the. Um, Do you remember yeah, the episode but, of yeah, Name, but, but Name, also Name, the where weight. the man threw a javelin through his own neck? Yes, I did see that. <laughs> and the, the, the one where um, the one where the guy got stuck in he he got stuck in a lift, and instead of just waiting for the people to come and fix the lift, he crawled up um, through the roof and got stuck in the lift shaft. Do you remember this one? Is oh that what he did? man. Uh, it was one of the first episodes, and it gave me nightmares. I was about six or seven years old, and I was so frightened. Can I tell you, so, there's um, there's two episodes of Casualty that I remember. Uh, one, yeah. a young girl, uh, you know, a tween age, uh, on roller skates, thinking she could go down some steps. Yeah? She did not. Next to the steps, iron fencing, you know, with the oh, sharp no. point thing. Goes through here. Oh, comes geez. out in the mouth, and they had to saw it off and take it to the casualty. Ca- uh, for international listeners, Casualty... There's a show on, I don't know if it's still going. They had Casualty in Holby City. That's sort Saturday of, night. You know, Saturday night, uh, let's watch this and so imagine all the it. horrible things that could happen yeah. to us. Um, and each episode had little different storylines where people horribly hurt themselves. The other one I always remember, two young lads breaking into a factory or something on the roof. Uh, they fall through the roof, uh, only a thin timber cladding. Of course, they fall through. Um, one of them hits the floor and the other one sort of has a piece of metal go through his leg and he's dangling oh. from this thing. And I remember my mother saying, it's the one who hit the floor. That's the one that's in trouble. I, don't know I, 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 I tell you, that. you didn't want to be someone within the first 15 minutes of casualty. Exactly. Like, like, a family domestic situation horrible. and yeah. everyone's happy and having a pretty good time and you it's think someone's show. going to die. It was, anyway, always, yeah. it was always something like, um, oh, I think I'll just go up to have a bath now. And yeah. then the, the dad comes home and says, I love this new toaster I've bought. Yeah. Maybe I'll try it. <laughs> In the bath. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Whoops. No. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there you go. Casualty. I'm sure everyone listening now that has seen Casualty before is flooded with memories of Casualty. What's the longest you've ever waited an A&E for? Uh, no, uh, I've not been to A&E. I've you've never to been that. to A&E? I haven't thrown a javelin through my own neck. I think I could walk around with a javelin Sorry, you've never neck. been to A&E? Uh, Are you making the joke? No. What? I've not been injured like You've that. never been to A and E. No, not for me. No. You're not broken a bone. No. This is weird. You've been to A and E. Yeah. Even so, producer Sully's only twenty-one. He's been to A and E. Seb, uh, how many times have you been to A and E? Oh, uh, quite a few. Yeah. You're that's... not not always not always for me, but I I spent. You know, waiting for other people, or you know, yeah, it's said there is with his metal pipes. Not always just going out, hanging out, waiting for people in A and E. Exactly, <laughs> getting them when they're weak, coming out. You're such a bastard. <laughs> Pick on someone with with full health, yeah. you know, with vitality. Anyway, I can't believe you've never been to A and E. Have you been to a hospital? Yeah. What for? <laughs> Well, just look around. Yeah, You've never yeah. been injured. Just have a look around, yeah. You've never been that ill or injured. I can't uh, believe this. Oh, You're no. 35 years old. I, I, I How been, have you managed I have been, to? I'm not telling you why on a podcast. To A&E. Yeah. You tell me afterwards. Uh, yeah. Fine. Yeah. Goodness gracious. And then we'll put it on next week's, you know. Yeah, yeah fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, speaking of A&E, you'll need to go to A&E after you well, read this book. If you're an A&E... <laughs> That's also true. If you're in, the, in the waiting room. In the waiting room. Why One not? thing you'd love to have, Uncle Damien. Remember, I said at the beginning we've been not. We we're going to say some very confusing thing about Uncle Damien. Uncle chatting to Uncle Damien the other, the other day, and Uncle Damien, as Seb and JJ here may know, uh, good friends with Mark Leach. Mark Leach, one of the greatest football photographers of all time, a uh, fantastic uh, football photographer. He has put together a book. It's a lovely coffee table book. Uh, called, it's called the, This Sporting Life, and it's of the archive of the work of Jerry Cranham, who is genuinely one of the most outstanding photographers I, uh, whose work I've ever seen. Uh, I, 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 uh, I got this book, uh, and they did an initial sort of um, crowd crowd raising run, uh, funding run, and I got it. It arrived uh, a few weeks ago. It's stunning. It's so good. Uh, Jerry did a lot of um, horse racing as well, and um, some of the photos 
are amazing. He, he sort of pioneered different techniques. So, for example, he was the first person, as I understand it, to, I mean, idiot, to lie down under the, what do they call it in horse racing, where they have the big hedge they jump over? A hurdle? A horse hedge, I think it's horse called. hedge? You know, but if you imagine where the horses jump over the horse hedge, on the other side of that little divot, you know, he would lie mm. down under that to take photos of horses jumping over him above. I mean, maybe it was a remote camera. It probably was a remote. In fact, it was a remote camera. I remember them saying that. Whatever. Still cool. Um, he took all these amazing colour photos of the uh, 1966 World Cup. Still cool with horses. And, the uh, World Cup? The, of the World Cup. I mean, he's been to every World Cup. I mean, honestly, some of the photos are extraordinary. And 1963, I think, there's one that... Uh, Seb, I can't remember the name of the Spurs goalkeeper but it's at Old White Hart Lane and it's in the fog and it's black and white. And bear in mind, that, it, I think it is, like bear in mind that the, the, the pictures, the cameras that he would have been using at the time, this photograph is one of the coolest things I have ever f- seen in my life. Anyway, you can get the book. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll put a link uh, in, the, in the description if people want to go and buy it or even just go and, if you, if you, ha- if you can't afford the book, just go and have a look at uh, Jerry Cranham's uh, photos on, uh, on Google Images or wherever. Um, they're absolutely extraordinary. Uh, I know it's appreciated it's after Christmas now, but if you've got gifting coming up, tell you what, the receiver of this gift will not be disappointed. And in the new revised editions, there's an extra photograph at the back of Seb lobbing a metal pipe during yes. the Sevilla Derby. And the reason that you went to A&E, <laughs> of yeah. course. Yeah. You'll have to tell us about that later. Seb's um, a metal pipe. But uh, yes, this sporting life, Jerry Cranham. Uh, we'll leave a link in the description, but... Um, uh, chatting to Uncle Damien yesterday, JJ. It uh, sounds like we're going to do a little TIFO quiz there at some point as well. We are going to do a TIFO quiz. It's going to mm. be really fun. So information for that will come up soon. And yes, it will. Come and uh, do our quiz, which will be about football, I'd imagine. I would imagine. Because that's just what we do. That well, it makes sense. be funny if, if we told him it was going to be about that, but then it was about something else entirely. Hogs. You know? Hogs, yeah. <laughs> Anyway, we don't. The one before is very successful, so we do another one. But um, if you're in the area, just head down to the old Reliant anyway <laughs> to see the hogs. Uh, no, I tell you, it's the best pub in London to watch football. And I can tell you, given that um, you know uh, people stopped going out a little bit over the last month or so, the old Reliant really needs your support. So head down if you're an angel, the old Red Lion Theatre pub. Uh, there we go. Thanks to Uncle Damien. Now, uh, JJ Bull the Bullard, thanks to you. Thank you, Joe Devine. And uh, danke schön, auf Wiedersehen, Seb Stafford Bloor. Vielen Dank, Herr Devine. Yes, we'll be back uh, next week as usual with with Alex Stewart, I believe. Um, thanks to uh, to producer Sol and Adonis. Um, and uh, catch you on the flippity flip, huh? Huh?